Warning, this video spoils the entirety of the chapters covered here within. If you wish to experience them without being spoiled, turn back now. Okay, so I don't want this to be a normal thing that I do, but I didn't do a, well, I guess this one would be more fitting. I didn't do a One Piece review last week for chapter 1058, and now that 1059 is out, um, I'm going to do a double review for that. And I also never did a review for Chainsaw Chapter 10, uh, 103. So this is going to be another one of those uh, big boy combination videos. Uh, really just two series fusion, uh, fusion ha style. Um, I don't want these to be a normal thing. I feel really bad that it's taken this long. Especially because I loved Chapter uh, 1058. And I loved Chapter 103. And I didn't want to have to wait this long to make these videos. But work schedule was wonky. Um... I just never got the free time to do it. You might also realize that the One Piece one has this little, um, I guess, audio status thing. It's kind of annoying, not going to lie. Uh, I'll get rid of it, but that was just something I was messing with. Um, I want to get a waveform to do that, so it's not just a static picture the entire time, but we'll see. Um, but we're going to start with Chainsaw because there's only one chapter for that. And then we're going to move on to One Piece. We're going to do 1058 first. And then we're going to do 1059. I have it all laid out. Why is that text like that? There we go. So yeah. Um, I guess until we get there, we'll do it. We'll go to Chainsaw. <laughs> um, but yeah. So Chainsaw Chapter 103 is our big reintroduction to Denji. We haven't actually seen him himself since the end of part one. Um, and this is, what, six chapters into part two. It looks, at least to me, that he is going to reclaim the main character's spot. We'll see, though. Uh, 104 should be coming out in a few days. I'm recording this on Friday. That uh, Friday the 9th is when I'm recording this. So... New chapter should come out next Tuesday. We didn't get one this week. But it looks like we're getting reintroduced to Denji as a main character. And Denji is the way Denji is. That panel of part one of him holding the TV crying saying they love me. Yeah, that's the exact same energy I'm getting off of Denji from this. Denji is riding the high of being the Chainsaw Man. And nothing is more evident in my mind then everyone, when they interview all these different people to see what they think of Chainsaw Man, a few people have positive things, a few people have negative things. Um, One person thinks that he eats people, the other one thinks that he eats cats. And then Denji. The juxtaposition of the pages is the fact that for two pages in a row, you have six panels of six different people giving their answers in an interview. And then for a full page, you have Denji. Saying, if you ask me, Chainsaw Man hasn't eaten the cat. At my school, everybody loves Chainsaw Man. He's great, right? The chainsaws are gartastic, but that's what's so cool about him. Not that I know the dude, but I bet he's an incredibly serious, great guy. By the way, just my guess, Chainsaw Man's number is 3-4, and then he gets cut off. That, that is Denji's energy. <laughs> um, that dumb... He, he says it himself in this chapter later on. Uh, Yoshida takes him to a cafe to talk to him. And he tells him that if you keep acting the way you are, if you keep being Chainsaw Man, your life is going to have to... Your life, as you know it, is going to end. You're going to become Target again, like you were with Makuma, like you were with the Assassins. And speaking of the Assassins, Yoshida brings that up. Just like, yeah, I was there when the when you got hunted by all the Assassins. And Denji's just like, never happened. Um, I don't know if that was Denji playing dumb to not have to talk to him. Or thinking that uh, if he said that, he'd actually believe him. <laughs> but uh, Yoshida basically tells him, and I'll read the panel uh, word for word. My point is, it'll be trouble if the public finds out you're Chainsaw Man. And Denji had ordered all this food on Yoshida's tab. And he asks, what's going to happen if they find out? And Yoshida takes the silverware and tells him, I won't let you eat this cake. Which, in my mind at least, is him saying... His life as he knows it with the um, comfortability of being able to sit down in a diner, eat cake, eat spaghetti, and all this stuff. 
if the people find out you're Chainsaw Man, it's over. They are going to hunt you. You're, you'll become a celebrity, but they will hunt you. And Yoshida goes on to say, We don't want you turning into Chainsaw Man. If you let the cat out of the bag, the life you have will fall apart. Besides, why are you fighting devils as Chainsaw Man anyway? You don't strike me as an altruist, and you don't get paid for it either, so why bother? Because if you remember back to part one, the main reason why Denji was a devil hunter was to get money. He sold all those organs, he sold his eye to pay off a debt that his dad had. And that's why he joined the um, commission, was on Makama's, at that point, order to join the commission so he can get money, live a normal life, because the people he was indebted to were already dead. And that's what kept him going for a decent amount of part one alongside his uh, relationship with Makama. So, the fact that he isn't getting paid for these hunts is a very good point on Yoshida's part. Like, you're not getting paid for them. Why are you doing them? And Denji says he fights because he wants people to find out that he's devil, that he's Chainsaw Man. And when asked why he wants people to find out, his reply is very polarizing. Um, his reply is, because peop once people find out I'm Chainsaw Man, the ladies will be all over me. And I saw a lot of people say this is a very undengy thing because of his... Re with what happened with Makama and what happened with Power, he wouldn't just be like this anymore. He would have matured. And yeah, sure, I get the thing of wanting your main character to mature from his experiences, but Denji isn't like that. Every arc that Denji goes through, you'd think that he would learn a lesson, right? Like with Reese, you'd think that he would learn people only want you to be Chainsaw Man. They don't want you for you. Which he points out at the end of Art 1. Makuma only ever saw him for Chainsaw Man, never himself. And that's a lesson that he actually learns at that point. At the end of the series, he remembers that Reese, that le uh, lesson Reese taught him. And you have all these different lessons sprinkled throughout the arcs. Like the Assassin's Arc, same thing. Um, and your ongoing thing is, if people find out you're Chainsaw Man, things are going to change. And they are going to change drastically, and they are going to go bad. And he he's pretty much just never cared. Like that thing of people only want you to be Chainsaw Man, yeah, sure, he, he used that as a lesson. But he never took that into consideration of, oh shit, people only want me to be Chainsaw Man. Or if people find out that I'm Chainsaw Man, my life was over. That's not what he learned. And I think this chapter does a really good job of getting us reintroduced to Denji. It shows us how he's changed since part one. But at the same time, he hasn't. Like, sure, he has these... um scenes where you think he'd be different you think he'd play a scene differently with Yoshida but he doesn't and I think this is a very good time to say this um Denji's character worked best not saying it didn't work after this but it works best when he has a straight man to bounce off of so you have the hard uh hard cut Aki in part one and you have all of Denji's antics and you bounce off Aki and every so often he can get Aki to do something out of his personality like beating up that one guy um but when Aki died in part one there was what one or two chapters after that I think there was only one chapter after that where he was where Denji was by himself and with power and you get this thing of like mind you they are grieving yes but it doesn't feel normal like it doesn't feel right I guess um and now with Yoshida being introduced for seemingly a similar role to Aki to kind of watch over Denji, make sure nothing happens, um, which I didn't even touch on. Yoshida says that he is a member of a, an organization that's been tasked with keeping an eye on him, and he makes it a very clear thing. It's not an evil organization like in some manga. It, their goal is simply to make sure that he has a peaceful life. And sure, this sounds really nice. And yeah, Yoshida is actually like following through on that. He's telling Denji, hey, if you're going to keep being Chainsaw Man, your life is going to be over. Like, you don't need to do this anymore. So it kind of seems like he's actually doing that, and he's not bullshitting Denji. He could be just straight up lying and uh, being two-faced, but from what we know of him, he has no reason to do that. We don't know if he's a member, if the organization actually is evil or whatnot. We don't know. It's going to be something that we have to figure out from here on out. Just like Denji, we're going to be along with the ride 
we're gonna be along with him for the ride for a long time. Um, but another thing I want to comment on is that page that I already talked about with Denji saying when they find out he's Chainsaw Man, the girls will be all over him. People on Twitter took this single page, or I guess double page spread, to mean that this is not Denji. This is some kind of imposter. Denji must be tied up in being in a basement somewhere and someone stole the Chainsaw Devil from him or what the fuck ever. And I do not get that at all. Those are, the, those are the people who want Denji to mature and want him to have learned from his mistakes. When, yeah, again, that's a normal thing for most main characters to do, but this isn't normal. Chainsaw Man, for its entire run, has always spat in the face of what a normal shonen is. Like, this is this is Chainsaw Man. This is a gory-ass series. Which, yeah, sure, you're getting more gory series in uh, shonen here lately. We're kind of going back to, like, Fist of the North Star and JoJo's uh, era, so, like, the 80s. Kind of bouncing away from the uh, more Naruto and... I don't... I've never read the Naruto or Bleach manga, so, like, that the kind of era that that had. That no gore, deaths are very clean. And, um... I like the fact that we're coming back to a more gory aspect, because a lot of uh, shonen are doing that, Chainsaw Man being the obvious one. But my hero is starting to delve into a little bit more gory stuff. Not like intestines and shit. But there have been some big character kills lately. Um, that are getting written out. I'm not even going to touch on that. Um, but yeah. I like the fact that Shonen's kind of coming back to being gory. And new series are coming out too. That's the thing. Um, there's one series on Twitter that's a female-led fantasy action that's in Shonen Jump that I didn't know about, and this is uh, its first week being out, and it looks really good. Like, it, I don't know what it's about, obviously, but I, I want to read it, and that's the issue. This is completely off of Chainsaw Man, but I wish that there was a more, a bigger base of either fans or official translations for all these smaller series. Because you have to think about it. One Piece doesn't even get an official translation for a, a few days. From Friday to Sunday, basically, there's no official translation. It's TCB carrying it. And Chainsaw Man is an outlier because this is released on Jump Plus. It's not even in a magazine. This is released straight up digitally. So this is different. Obviously, they can do translations like this. But I wish that Shonen Jump had a faster translation officially or that more groups would translate Shonen like this. Because right now, we're stuck with some of the bigger players. Um, I'm not saying that they're all, like, low-key, like, no fans, but, like, a lot of the series that you associate with Shonen Jump are the big ones, obviously. But you don't think of the small ones other than, like, My Hero, Chainsaw, Undead Unluck is one, Black Clover, uh, Mashal, I think, is Shonen. Like, those. Anything other than those that I'm not thinking of right now, I want to get into. So, you might see a few... Um, series reviews from me that I do off of those. Maybe even like weekly. Re I might move the uh, One Piece reviews from just being One Piece to just straight up Shonen Jump reviews where I review multiple chapters of different series at once a, a week. So like, I don't know. Um, but yeah. Sorry, went off on a little rant there. But um, I like this chapter because, again, we got reintroduced to Denji. We see that he is him basically. And I want to make this comment because I haven't yet. Denji looks really fucking nice in Fujimoto's now, I guess, time, not time-sensitive art style. Like, he can take his time with the art. And I like that. Because if you look at a lot of the panels of Denji, it might also just be because of the fact that um, he's more mature, so Fujimoto is drawing him this way. But he has a very defined jawline in a lot of his panels. And I really like that. Because part one, yeah, sure, he had a defined jawline. But, like, this jawline looks realistic. And this one looks like it would belong to a teenage bo uh, boy. But another moment that I haven't touched on. And then we will move to One Piece. Because Chainsaw Man chapters are good. But this chapter just didn't have a whole lot to digest. Um, there comes a scene where the TV reporters are recording an audience shouting, Chainsaw Man, Chainsaw Man, Chainsaw Man. And Denji hits a like a hero pose, and oh my god, if Denji doesn't get found out to be Chainsaw Man eventually, I'm gonna I'm gonna be upset. 
Because, like, you have all this buildup of the ladies will be all over me. You have everyone warning him against this stuff. And his actions like this, he has to be found out eventually. Um, but another thing, and then I will move to One Piece. Um, the line, girls will be all over me, couldn't be more true. Because we know a certain girl who wants to be all over Chainsaw Man in a very murderous way. God, that's going to be fun to see. But a uh, pretty good chapter. Nice reintroduction to Denji. Low key, uh, a little bit of more a low-key chapter after all that uh, action in the last two chapters. I like it. Now we're more moving on to One Piece chapter 1058. And oh my god, I don't think anyone was ready for this, bro. I really don't. Um, when this chapter dropped last week, the internet and Twitter specifically were literally lit on fire because of it. We got, spoiler alert, but not really spoiler alert, we got reintroduced to Crocodile, Mihawk, Buggy, um... We got a lot of exposition for what they're doing. We got new bounties for the Straw Hats. All this shit happened in one chapter. And we got... uh, You know what? I'm going to come back to the more um, walkthrough style. Because there was so much in this chapter, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, Because of Luffy's antics going off the waterfall, uh, Nami's pissed off. Jinbei tries to tell her it's okay. But um, she uses uh, joke conqueror's hockey. Which, like, bro, I'm not gonna lie, using Oda's logic, this could 100% be real Congress hockey. Um, but we have the crew kind of getting back into the group of thing. Um, Frankie's fixing up the ship after a small fall, after the fall, and it did a little bit of damage, but not a whole lot. And then the bounty bird comes, and Sanji comes with all the. Bounty posters and trips and falls, and they all go flying to each member. And something interesting is the fact that a panel or a text box is said, updated bounties for the leaders of the 5,600-man Grand Fleet, Emperor Straw Hat Luffy and his Grand Commanders. And we have to remember, Luffy already has the bounty of 300, uh, 3 billion, so we're, not, we're probably not going to get that bounty um, retold to us here soon because we have to remember that. But this is more for the rest of the crew. Chopper has the single largest percent increase in One Piece. It is a 1,000% increase to 1,000 berries. Uh, And they all get different titles. Uh, Dr. Chopper, the cotton candy lover. Uh, The Nami is the cat burglar with a bounty of 366 million. Brook is the musician Soul King Brook with a bounty of 383 million. Shipwright Cyborg Frankie, whose bounty poster is the Thousand Sunny, with a bounty of 394 million. Sniper God Usopp, with a bounty of 500 million, so half a billion. Archaeologist Devil Child Nico Robin, 930 million. Cook Black Lake Sanji, bounty 1 billion, 32 million. Helmsman Jinbei, the Knight of the Sea, bounty 1.1 billion. Swordsman, Pirate Hunter Zoro, bounty 1.111 billion. Which means Sanji now has the fourth highest bounty in the crew. Forget your number two and number three argument. Nah, Jinbei's here, and he has a higher bounty than Sanji. Which means, on top of the fact that Jinbei's bounty was withheld because he was a... um. Because he was a warlord. We don't know how much got increased because of that. But holy shit. He has a, what was it again? A 1.1 billion berry bounty. That is insane. And yes, I guarantee a lot of it was due to the fact that he is now with the Straw Hats. But like, not all of it is. A lot of that is probably tracked with the fact that he was a warlord. He was a sun pirate for how long? That shit. Um, and then we get to see a different point of view. One that, not gonna lie, I liked more than the Straw Hat Bounty Reveal. Even though this is my first Straw Hat Bounty Reveal while reading uh, Weekly. We have Cross Guild. 
and the dynamic between the three leaders is holy shit hilarious. Buggy is not the leader of Cross Guild, as we were led to believe with the poster. In actuality, Meathawk and Crocodile are the two co-leaders. But Buggy had told his people to make the uh, poster, and they had made it more flattering for Buggy himself. So that's why. And Crocodile and Meathawk are obviously pissed off about this, and they beat him up, threaten him with death. But later on, uh, Meathawk and Crocodile come to the agreement that maybe it's better if we use Buggy as like a figurehead, and we can kind of just not get all the heat he can instead. And Mihawk just straight, straight up says he doesn't want anything. He just wants to live a quiet life. But we get a very interesting scene, which is a flashback to when the um, Marines were coming for the island. Uh, Gloom Island. And Mihawk got a call from Crocodile. And um, it, from Mihawk's dialogue, he says, Marines keep swar swarming the island. It's a nuisance, but I suppose I'll just have to relocate. Meaning that Mihawk has fought off the Marines apparently multiple times now. Like, they keep sending wave after wave, and he's like, nah, fuck you. <laughs> At least that's what I get. It might just be the fact that they are consistently around his island. But then Mihawk, uh, sorry, Crocodile returns with saying, this just shows that it would be beneficial for us to team up. The Navy wouldn't take an organization headed by the two of us lightly. After all, they used to refer to you as Marine Hunter, which is really interesting. God, take a shot every time I say really interesting in a One Piece review, you're going to die. But it's really cool because that explains why the Marines now have bounties. Like, sure, when the Cross Guild was revealed, everyone assumed, oh, Buggy's bullshitting to pay the bounties, but, like, that's it. But no, with the fact that they have a guy who was called the Marine Hunter... They might legitimately be able to pay off some of these bounties. And it'll be really interesting to see what bounties Marines get eventually. Because in the new chapter, 1059, we do get to see a Marine, but we don't get his bounty. So, it'll be really interesting to see the, um... I guess I can call it the comparison. Because if you take a pirate like... Axe... Uh, not a pirate. A Marine like Axe Hand Morgan, right? really strong at the time, hyped up to be the super strong guy. But, like, his bounty cannot be that high. His bounty probably, if anything, is comparable to, like, Luffy's first bounty. Maybe not even that. Because that was after he had defeated Crocodile on top of everyone before that. So, nah, I guarantee, like, Morgan's bounty is going to be, like, 25 million. That's it. If I'm remembering bounties correctly. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I think it's really interesting. Again, sh take a shot that that's why Mihawk and Crocodile are teaming up, along with the fact that they both do not trust anyone. Uh, and then we see that the warships are coming for Buggy, and Crocodile was coming for Buggy as well, but for different reasons. Buggy owes Crocodile money, and um, Crocodile says that he needs the money to open a, to start a company that he wants. Uh, he's about to form a company, so he needs the capital. And Buggy says that he can uh, just... Um, sorry. And Buggy asks, Then why don't you let me join? You could, accompany my, you could acquire my company to help start yours. It may not be much, but you'll get a former warlord serving you. And that's why Buggy's in the Cross Guild. Because he owed a debt. And that's when we get the scene of the Marine, of the fact that the explanation for the poster is because Buggy's hand men handled it. Um, and then we get to see two very interesting bounties that I don't think anyone really expected us to get in this chapter, but it's interesting. Again, interesting. Um, Crocodile, because of the fact that him and Mihawk are in Cross Guild. This is a former warlord. He has a Logia flute, fruit. He's really fucking smart, and everything. They have given him a bounty of 1.965 billion berries, which is a lot for our first confirmed bounty for him. That is significantly higher than Jinbei's, meaning, like, strength-wise, probably means he's, got, he's probably way stronger than Jinbei, to be real. 
and then the bounty and the dialogue that pissed off fans. Mihawks. His fellow warlord, Dracul Mihawk, has even greater sword skills than the red-haired emperor. He's worth 3.59 billion berries, a fitting total for the world's greatest swordsman. The single dialogue of greater sword skills than red-haired Shanks literally cooked the fan base alive. Does this mean that Mihawk is actually stronger than Shanks? Uh, does this just mean that in simply sc uh, swordsmanship he's stronger? All this stuff. When it's not that hard. The, it, it spells it out. Even the TCB does. In terms of swordsman, uh, swordsmanship, Mihawk is stronger than Shanks. Straight up. But when you add in hockey, Shanks is stronger. Probably. Due to his bounty being higher and everything... I'm willing to say that with hockey, Shanks is significantly stronger than Mihawk. And I'd like to say, I didn't exactly call Mihawk joining with Crocodile and Buggy. I think a few weeks back, I said that he probably joined up with either the Shanks Pirate or with the Red Haired Pirates or with fellow Warlords. But yeah, that was it. Now we get Buggy's bounty. Remember, completely bullshitted because he does not deserve this bounty. It is lower. It is significantly lower than Mihawk's. Mihawk had a 3.59 billion berry bounty, and Buggy has a 3.189 berry bounty. Which, again, very high. Still higher than Luffy. But Luffy's is relatively low because of the fact that they had to split the difference between three people, and they didn't want the Nika fruit to get revealed. So that's why his bounty is lower, so kind of checks. And then we get a meeting of the Cross Guild and its three leaders where um, we get to see that Buggy is crying and everyone thinks that it's because he's so he's so emotional about this. But no, he is scared to death of what's going to happen to him. And then another point of view, we get the revolutionaries and it turns out. They survived, they were able to meet back up, they got Kuma, but nobody knows if, Sa if Sabo actually killed uh, Cobra. And Dragon asks Kuma, tell me what exactly did you see? And all Kuma says is, I am yours to command master because he is still in the mindset of being a slave. That's either going to take a long time to fix, or it just will never get fixed at all. Because you have to think, as a revolutionary, um, Dragon, Kuma, and Ivankov all were friends. We saw that in Marine Ford, where Ivankov really didn't want to fight Kuma, but would if uh, it came to it. So seeing your fellow leader of the revolutionaries forced into this kind of existence has to suck. And Cobra says, I'm glad he's okay in reference to Sabo. But if he truly did murder Cobra, I won't forgive him no matter what his reasons were. Because, yeah, sure, the revolutionaries were never exactly a non-violent group. But they, they, they never murdered leaders of kingdoms. Like, sure, they, they would cause a war every so often, but like, they wouldn't murder a king. They would kind of just uh, overthrow him, let the people do it. And then we get a Den Den Mushi ringing, and we see the Marines are actually listening in. And all we get on the tease of who's on the other line is, it's me, Sabo. Which is perfect. If we'd gotten any more, it would have felt like we are kind of getting overwhelmed in one chapter with all this different stuff. So the simply, it's me, Sabo, is good. We don't know the context of it. We don't know if he's actually okay or whatnot. But it's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting. I'm going to say it a million times for this video. All in all, Chapter gave us a lot of content, lots of different points of views. I enjoyed the deeper look into Cross Guild, which I thought I knew we were going to get no matter what. We couldn't just leave it as they exist and that's it. I knew we were going to have to get at least some explanation on their group dynamic. Some explanation of how they came to be, how they joined up with Buggy, Mihawk, and Crocodile all coming together. 
But this did a good job of it. It also gave us a very good... Sorry. It also gave us a very good look at their dynamic. It gave us a good look at the fact that, yeah, Buggy's not at all a leader. He's a figurehead. So good chapter. Lots of content, lots to chew on, and it kept us tied it over for a week until we got chapter... 1059 today that's why I'm doing this video right now is because um, this video this chapter just came out so I want to get this done and uploaded for three chapters uh, and this chapter is just straight up named the Captain Kobe incident and I didn't talk about it with the last chapter but I will now uh, last chapter's cover story was uh, Caesar asking to be took uh, for Germa to take them him with them, and this chapter we get to see the effects of the hallucinage of the gas that was used, and it was a hallucinate hallucinogenic gas which made Katakuri and Oven punch each other. That's it. <laughs> um, and again, this keeps up the thing of multiple points of view. It feels very much like a chapter 1058.5. It feels like an extension of that with all the different points of view. But we get to see that uh, Marco got a ride from the red-haired pirates to Sphinx, uh, the island of White, the Whitebeard's homeland. And Shanks asks him uh, he's not going to join the crew. And Marco has this really interesting dialogue of, I'm way too old and worn out to keep playing babysitter for you great pirates. And we get a little bit of a dynamic of the red-haired crew. And then we get a flashback to when Marco departed Wano. And it was when Luffy found out that Yamato wasn't coming with them. And it was really... now that we I wish we would have gotten this uh, in the chapter with Yamato saying that... Uh, they weren't going to be coming with the Straw Hats. But it makes a very good point of saying... Um, the Oda makes a very good point of having Yamato say, You probably already know this, but the forest guy was only driven off thanks to whoever caused that immense burst of hockey. Kaido might be gone now, but his absence has opened up the floodgates for guys like that to pour into the country. Can't just abandon everyone now... Can't just abandon everyone... Can't just abandon everyone now, can I? Besides, I doubt either of us would enjoy our adventures if we were worrying about Wano. But man, I still really wanted to be one of you, a real crewmate. So Yamato is staying behind because to protect Wano, to make sure that no one like Green Bull comes, and just to make sure that Luffy doesn't have to worry about Wano. And you have to remember, Luffy already said Kinemon, Momo, and Yamato were all effectively members of the crew. They just weren't coming with them. Uh, Zoro says Momo has a lot of pride to make sure not to hurt it. And Yamato Strip says, I'll find another reason to stay, which was the, um, I want to, I want to do a tour of Wano before I leave. And then we get to see Marco and Luffy actually interacting, in which Luffy thanks him for saving him back at Marineford. And Marco says, back then we all seemed so ready to spring into action. Makes you wonder why, doesn't it, Jinbei? And we get, in my opinion, the single most touching bit of dialogue that we could have gotten from Marco. Because I have a feeling Marco is probably not going to be coming back in the story. At least for a while, maybe not at all. But we get the single panel that I think we needed to see the most. Or hear the most. I'm sure Ace would be proud to see how far you've come. And holy shit, I'm about to cry. I've read this chapter three times already. But just the fact... That the man who was closest to Ace for how long? While he was with the Whitebeard Pirates. In terms of strength. In terms of everything. Is at this point saying that Ace would be proud of how far Luffy has come. Because you have to think. Ace talked about Luffy incessant, incessantly. He talked to Yamato about Luffy. He talked to Deuce about Luffy. Everything. Everyone he talked to, he talked to about Luffy. And oh my god, he would... I I fully agree with Marco. He would be so proud of Luffy right now. Um, And then we get another point of view. And this one, holy shit. When this one was revealed in the leaks, this was the one chapter for the first time in a while 
where I was not swallowing the leaks as they came out. I was not suckling from the great leak titty for this week. Holy shit. When they told me that Hancock, Rayleigh, Blackbeard, Kobe, and the new pacifistas were in one chapter on the same island at once, I didn't fucking believe it. But oh my god, Oda is a genius at writing. Um, I'm not going to start the little flashback or the present time that we get before the flashback. I'm just going to go straight into the flashback. The, uh, due to the fact that Hancock is one for being a warlord, they sent the new pacifistas after her along with ca uh, Captain Kobe. And the new pacifistas, as we will find out later on in the chapter, are literally children versions of seemingly the warlords, if not some other weird connection, but they're child versions of the warlords who are combined with Lunarian DNA because of the fact that they have dark skin, wings, um, dark skin, black wings, all this stuff. And we get to see that the Marines actually are having some attention pulled because Blackbeard pirates are on the are coming to the island. And Blackbeard uses a sea quake, and one of the Marines points out a very good thing, or a very smart thing, which I never thought about the usage of the Gura Gura Nomi, but when you use it on the sea, you can just draw the attention of sea kings to wherever you are. And if your enemies aren't prepared to deal with the sea kings, oh fuck, oh shit, they're done. <laughs> but the Blackbeard pirates are on the island of Whammon, and we see that some vice admirals are there leading the charge and all this stuff. And we see that Blackbeard and a few of his commanders being Katri uh, Katarina and one other that I'm forgetting his name um, are on the island. And I'd like to speak for a second on the dynamic of the Blackbeard pirates. And it's the fact that they all kind of have the same mindset of we need to capture uh, Hancock. And, oh my god, for the first time in One Piece, I'm actually, like, concerned about a character and their, like, sexuality and how, like, the, the dude. The, okay, so the full panel is Katarina saying, uh, that Kankak, what a gorgeous face. Her head will make a wonderful trophy after I wring her neck. And Blackbeard replies with, you can have your way with her after we take her powers, because obviously that's going to be their uh, goal here. He's very obviously going to hunt down different warlords to get their powers if he can take multiple at once that's it but uh, with the fact that he's going after hancock maybe he just wants as many as possible i don't know but the guy with the fucking gesture hat i don't know his name but he says hang on don't you think we could have more fun with her if we took her alive i don't even need to say what that's implying I feel uncomfortable. I'm moving on now. And the vice admiral on the ship has to give the Marines permission to engage Blackbeard because he's a Marine. And he says that they have to wait until they can get word from HQ. And that's when we see that Kobe was apparently there fighting, either fighting uh, Hancock directly or his Marines were fighting her. And we see that he just straight up says, Hancock, the Navy isn't looking for a fight. If you surrender to us, I promise we'll leave immediately. Meaning that they will not tramp on the island. They won't fight anymore. They will get out of there as quick as possible. Avoid Blackbeard at all costs. And Hancock, in her character, says, Don't waste your breath. I'll never submit to another's captivity. And her sisters tell her, don't fight. And then we see that the uh the new pacifista is taking out some of the blackbeard pirates with their white hair, brown skin and black wings and with the little tattoo of px on them we see there is a child mihawk and there is a child hancock that we saw earlier and the mihawk one is fighting blackbeard he's able to block its sword with some armor hockey on his arm but the cut is able to cut the island basically like one third of it just detaches very similar to what we saw Mihawk do at Marine Ford, just one slash, just cutting an island up. And uh, Blackbeard uses Black Hole. Me, uh, 
Hancock uses his slave arrow to turn a bunch of the Marines into statues, including Helmeppo and the Vice Admiral. And Kobe says, uh, tells the pacifista to not attack because it'll kill the statues. And we can see that while she was trying to attack Blackbeard, Blackbeard was able to grab her and starts taking her power from her with the black hole around his arm absorbing her power. Slowly, it's a process thing. And one of the Kuja pirates straight up says she can't use her powers. And uh, Blackbeard gives her a little bit of credit saying they don't call you Empress for nothing. She was strong and uh, he says most of the morons on my crew were petrified. You sure got us good. I've had my eye on your power for a while now. A beauty is what make and sorry, I thought that was Black Crystal talking. And Hancock says, My beauty is what makes this power formidable. If you kill me, all your little friends will remain statues forever. Whoever inherits my power won't be able to release them. And um Kobe give Kobe's basically just hyping her up, saying, I knew it, Hancock is far trickier than anyone expected. And Blackbeard, Blackbeard and Kobe get this little talk where it's like, yo, what do we do? If I, if I kill her, b both of our guys are gone. Like, they're statues forever. And Kobe says, like, yeah, it, it would suck for me if they were statues. And um, Hancock says that she will let them, if they l promise to leave the island, she will turn everyone back to normal. And Blackbeard calls her bluff, saying that, uh, she'll just turn Kobe and Blackbeard into statues the second that he lets her go. And he goes to kill her. And then, conquers hockey! ba -da! And this is when I kind of lost my shit reading this chapter the first time. Rayleigh comes up, seemingly knowing exactly how to get to this island, right? Like we've seen before. He just knows how to get here. And I think his dialogue on this page is very important. Uh, just because of the fact that he went out of his way to save Hancock of all the warlords. I knew the Navy would lay siege to this island, but I didn't think the terrain here would get this devastated. Sorry I'm late, Hancock. Whitebeard's old apprentice, huh? I know it's immature to admit this, but I really don't like you. Hancock, release everyone that's been turned to stone. I will ensure this de-escalates without issue. When the invaders leave the island, I won't allow any funny business. So, one... We have to remember that Rayleigh was Roger's second-hand man. He obviously saw Blackbeard in action a few times during their fights, so he's able to identify him as Whitebeard's apprentice along with what happened at Marineford, and straight up tells him, I don't like you. It would seem that Rayleigh came specifically to help de-escalate the situation and to make sure that Hancock didn't die. Which, as we'll find out on the next page, is because his seemingly wife... Shaki, uh, uh, the, the, the girl from Sabadi, uh, Shaki, was actually the ex-captain of the Kuja Pirates, meaning that she used to be, she was basically Hancock's position. And the hints for this were laid out for so long. Um, we find out that she, if I remember correctly, the dialogue from Sabadi was, um, love will make a woman do crazy things, uh, in reference to Ray Lee. And we got to dialogue during the Amazon Lily arc from the priestess saying the previous, uh, empress had also fallen in love, uh, in reference to Luffy and Hancock. And now we find out Ray Lee and, uh, Shaki. So that was very well planned out in Oda's mind. I'm going to think at least. I don't think this was an ass pull. There were definitely teases of it for a while. And um, Rayleigh says, I'm glad you were able to survive it, but she, all Hancock says is it's only because of you. And we find out that from Shaki or Rayleigh, uh, Vegapunk now has Seastone paddle boats out on the sea. And um, that's just interesting because... That means there are ships equipped with weaponry, I'm going to assume, to be able to deactivate Devil Fruits. So, they're really taking the fact that we don't have the Warlords anymore, but we never needed them. And they are running with that. We have the new Pacifistas, which are literally probably just Warlord clones, if not stronger. Uh, probably more Seastone weaponry than just that. And it's really... God, I, ha I don't think I've said it for this chapter yet. It's really interesting... 
to see that the Marines are the Marines are pushing. Like every single group of pirates or any large power group in this uh, world. So the emperors, the Marines, the former warlords, all of them are still going and pushing far because we still we have the fact that uh, Hancock got saved, so she's okay. She's active now. Uh, Mihawk and Crocodile with Cross Guild. The Emperors just being Emperors. And all this stuff is really, really cool. And to end the chapter, we get the we get three things on the last page and a half. One, Rayleigh admits that he was only able to resolve things with his reputation. He couldn't have won an actual fight. So if the Blackbeard Pirates had wanted to engage him, he wouldn't have been able to beat him. He would have probably had to rely on the Marines if the Marines weren't trying to fight him. Hancock to help, all these things. Lucky that his reputation was able to help. Two, the new pacifistas, we get the dialogue from the two sisters. It was bizarre. One of them looked just like Big Sis when she was a kid in reference to Hancock. And three, Kobe is now missing and has been abducted by Blackbeard, and his current status is unknown. And that, my ladies and gents, and anything in between was the Captain Kobe incident. That is what happened on the island of Whammon. And, oh my god. <laughs> um, I thought of the name, like, the Captain Kobe incident. Um, It was going to be how Kobe came to be such a strong Marine and how he was able to fight uh, all these people, how he was able to capture Hancock. No, not at all. The Captain Kobe incident is what happened when Kobe couldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, Blackbird intervened, Rayleigh intervened, and the new pacifistas are released. This chapter, alongside the last chapter, massive things to chew on. And I think, oh boy, the post-Wano arc that we've been getting since, in my mind, since uh, Kaido went down. Which, yeah, sure, technically speaking, the unwinding uh, the unwinding chapters was still part of Act 3, and so were Green Bull's attacks. But I would consider that a post-Wano um, thing. Because if I remember correctly, technically speaking, Kuzan fighting Luffy back on Long Rain Longland was considered the post-Long Rain Longland arc. It wasn't, like, in the middle of the arc. Because Admiral encounters are always put to the end of the arc, in my opinion, unless they are the main focus. But, um, yeah. These chapters that we've gotten from pretty much when Kaido went down from on have all been really solid. We've gotten a lot of exposition chapters. We've gotten a lot of uh, show-don't-tell chapters like this one where you actually get to see what happened. We don't get, just get told uh, Blackbeard arrived, tried to mess up. Uh, Hancock couldn't do it because Rayleigh intervened. No. We got to see it happen, which I think is amazing. It would have been much easier for Oda to have just written it as a single panel saying, uh, this is what happened in this spot. We don't have to worry about it anymore. But from what I remember, the teaser text at the end of the chapter, uh, I already have my screen off so I can't read it, was the Straw Hat set out to a new island. So in my guess, the next chapter we're going to be back with the Straw Hats either seriously, like, long-term, or at least just for a little bit. We're going to get a tease of where they're going next, which I don't expect to straight-up be Elbaf. I expect there to be a rest stop before we get into that. Because, remember, we are straight off of Wano. We are straight off the hype of that. We're at least going to get a little bit of a respite. Maybe more of a... uh, Like a little garden arc, I'll say. One where the Elbaf arc can get hyped up and we get more build up to it. We don't just get thrown straight into it. That's what I'm expecting at least from the new island that they're going to land on. I don't expect, like I said, I don't expect it's just going to be straight up Elbaf right then and there. I think there's going to be at least one island before Elbaf, which makes the crew kind of think about what they're doing. Because you have to remember, coming straight off of Fishman Island, they had... Punk Hazard basically immediately after. Which is a fairly large jump because Punk Hazard threw them right into the Dressrosa saga 
and Dress Rosa threw them right into the Wano Saga. And coming straight after the Wano Saga, I don't think we can handle being thrown into another saga. We need at least one arc to kind of, just like Little Garden and uh, Punk Hazard did, be their own separate things, but at the same time, build the larger arc itself. Because Little Garden built the Alabasta arc, um, like I said, Punk Hazard built Dress Rosa and by extension Wano, and it's really cool to see that. And I hope that's what happens. I just, I really don't want to be thrown into just another arc, because I'm, I think I'm with a majority of the fans where if we, if that happens, we are going to get severe whiplash. The fans are just going to be complete, caught completely off guard, and we haven't even gotten time to digest the fate of our Wano characters. Like, we just now found out why Yamato was really staying behind. We can't just go straight into, like, these are our new uh, main characters for this arc. And seemingly, given the fact that the Straw Hats are now off of Wano, um, I think this is more of technically a um, 1058 thing, so I'll change that, though. Um, technically speaking, this means that Carrot will not be joining the crew. Carrot is gone. Carrot is going to be king of Zoe while Cat Viper and Dog Storm stay on Wano, which means no new y'all, uh, no new Nakama for the crew. Which I gotta say, I was like I said, I think last week I was kind of hoping Yamato would join just because of how much the buildup was there. But I think not doing it was probably the smartest move. Have all of our crewmates be established pre time skip. And not have them, not just throw us in a random character who, to be fair, only really talked to Luffy. Uh, Carrot would have been in at least the relationship with the Straw Hats. Oh my god, so funny. At least from the uh, relationship with the Straw Hats point of view, Carrot would have been the smarter pick. Because she actually had relationships with all the Straw Hats. Even though I did not like Carrot. I never did. I didn't like the fact that she was beelining fighting Perispero during Wano. Strictly because she thought that he quote-unquote killed Pedro. Even though he literally blew himself up. Like, bruh. That's it. That's my complaint about Carrot's character. I know a lot of people don't like it when you critique Carrot. But, fuck it. I did it anyway. Um, But, yeah. That has been... uh. Chainsaw Man, chapter 103, along with One Piece, chapter 158, New Emperor, and 159, the Captain Kobe incident. Um, depending on if I can find a reasonable translation of that one series I was talking about earlier, uh, I might end up actually doing the weekly Shonen Jump reviews where I review multiple chapters at once. In more long-form videos like this, probably mostly streamed. Um, because that's going to be a lot of content to record at once. And, yeah. I think it'll be interesting. I also finally re uh, released my first One Piece theory after God knows how long of talking about it. Um, it's doing decently well for one of my videos, at least. Um, it's not blowing up, but whatever. I didn't really expect it to. I just kind of wanted to get it out there. I do have another one. But I don't know if I really want to release that one yet um, until I see Film Red because I don't know if the character is mentioned in it, which apparently my first theory was completely contradicted or at least implied to be wrong in Film Red. So um, I felt like a buffoon for that. I knew I should have waited till Film Red released uh, and I could see it. But whatever. Uh, live, learn, and we all have regrets. Uh, this has been my review of Chainsaw Chapter 103, uh, One Piece Chapter 1058, and One Piece Chapter 1059. Um, if you enjoyed watching this video, um, let me know by hitting the like button. It really helps me out and lets me know I'm doing a good thing. If you have any comments, concerns, uh, things that I missed in the chapter, comments on what I talked about, anything that I missed in the chapter itself, uh, or chapters themselves, let me know by putting them in the comments. I don't always reply, but I always do read them. Um, and if you found my video, or if you found my channel through this video, or if you're a skulker, uh, make sure to hit subscribe, because I do do these, I at least try to do these videos for every single chapter that comes out. Um, and yeah, that's been it. 
Um, and until next time, stay safe, have fun, and read more manga. Okay, guys. Bye. <laughs>